Hello, Katie. Thank you for joining me. How are you doing today? Good. Hi, Chris. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, I'm very glad that you're here. So you just came out with this new workbook to help people with suicidal thoughts. So before we dive into what's in this book, can you give the audience a little bit of who you are, your background and all that kind of good stuff? Sure. I grew up in South Florida, and then I went to Florida State University as an undergraduate. And that really influenced my career and led up to this workbook because I worked with someone named Thomas Joyner, who is does a, is, has a leading theory of suicide and, and kind of working in his lab as an undergraduate really influenced the direction of my career. So I actually went back to graduate school at Florida State University with Thomas Joyner and continued to work with him. And while I was there, he was also writing books for the public about suicide and, give, and giving talks to the public and kind mm -hmm. of that instilled the value of the importance of taking information from research and sharing it with the people who most need it. Mm. So after I, I graduated, I was a professor for 10 years at North Dakota State University. And a little over two years ago, I left actually to left academia to be a full-time therapist. And just recently, as of April, I'm now 50% providing therapy services and 50% doing research on eating mm. disorders and suicidal behavior due to a grant that came in. And so it's been a little bit back and forth, but mostly along all in mental health and suicide prevention has always been a priority. Yeah, no, that that's that's awesome. And and yeah, like uh, eating disorders is something huge too. And there's probably a lot of crossover and correlation. Mm -hmm. Like when it comes to suicide and suicidal thoughts, like uh, as I mentioned before, our talk and you know, like I'm a recovering addict and you know, addiction, it was, you know, me slowly, killing myself and all that. So what what inspired you to, you know, put this this work book together? You know, uh, you're probably the first author I've had on the podcast talking about a workbook, you know, a lot of the books I read are just like, you know, the research and the data and all these other things. So why, why did you decide to go with a workbook? What's inside here? And how's it how's it help? Well, one of the big things in therapy that's important is working collaboratively to help people figure out what is causing the pain and mental health issues in their lives and what personal things might help them to feel better. And it's in therapy, it's a very, or it should be a very collaborative process where you're asking questions, you're throwing out ideas, you're getting feedback. And also the idea is that the person who's, who the patient is supposed to feel like they have some tools and exercises they can try to build up those skills. And so when reading a book, which that can be very helpful in its own ways, for sure, mm -hmm. it doesn't have that explicit inviting someone to really think about and participate. And a workbook, I went, I went with that also in discussions with my, um, with my acquisitions editor, so it wasn't all me. He he has a good sense of, of what there was a need for. Um, he it's also allowed me to have to guide people like you would in therapy because mm. I think that if someone is often if people just want to journal, they're not really sure where to start, especially if they're <laughs> feeling really low. So the idea was to have a framework, but make sure that it's something with a lot of input. And there are mental health workbooks out there, but they're actually are almost none specifically for suicidal thought. So it mm -hmm. seemed like there was really a gap there for this particular issue. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why it stuck out to me. And and I, I love the idea of a workbook. So something, uh, you know, on my YouTube channel, when I was like primarily mental health, I had started every video saying like, we talk about the problem, but focus on the solution, right? Because one of the reasons I even got into like, hey, we need to talk more about mental health is because I, I heard a lot of like, problem talking but i was like okay now what do i do like what do i what do i do and um with as many books as i read you know not only do i read about mental health and psychology and you know social issues a lot of them like i i close the book and i'm like okay now what what do i what do i do right so i love a the, the workbook because you have like worksheets and so many things in there so, so it's like if you pick up this book i can take action right like i could 
do something. Um, you know, some of them, some mental health books have like some exercises and everything like that. But yeah, uh, journaling was huge for me. And like, like you mentioned, um, sometimes we, we don't have any I don't know any direction. Like, what am mm -hmm. I? So, what am I supposed to write? You know, it's just like word vomit. And while that could be very helpful, mm -hmm. sometimes focusing on something specific. So, like, I came from a uh, twelve-step background, mm -hmm. right? A lot of writing, a lot of direction and stuff. And I, I started getting so much clarity about underlying causes and everything. And and speaking of underlying causes, that's kind of how the early chapters start out in the workbook. And I would love, love, love to chat about that. So starts out with, you know, understand your suicidal thoughts mm -hmm. and uncovering the causes. So yeah, I, I, you know, not only do friends and family members not understand, but those of us who struggle with it, we don't understand. So can you talk a little bit about where these come from, why it happens? Absolutely. I think that one of the challenges with suicidal thoughts in terms of figuring out where it's coming from is I think a lot of time with anxiety, we don't always know the source, but often there is some particular prompt or thing in the environment you can say, okay, well, this is what I'm anxious about. The suicidal thoughts, sometimes people experience them as just popping into their head and they're not sure why, mm -hmm. and they can feel very alarming to them. And I, I use the framework of Klonsky and his colleagues um, three-step theory, because mm. what I like about it is it talks about suicidal thoughts. One commonality across many different pathways is that people are experiencing a lot of pain and they're feeling hopeless about it. And one of the things that I found in, in working as a therapist and, in, and, and just knowing people in my personal life is that just helping to identify and get clarified, like what is the nature of that pain? Where is it coming from? That in and of itself can bring some relief because mm -hmm. it's like, okay, the pain is coming from this thing that happened to me, or it's coming from a fear that I'm not going to be able to take care of my family or whatever it is. And without knowing that, even thinking about solutions or those next steps, like you were talking about, can be so difficult. So mm -hmm. I think fundamentally where it comes where it comes from is this idea that there's so much pain, it's not gonna get better and I wanna escape it. And I think that is where suicidal thoughts most of the time come from. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's interesting, I was, I was looking over, uh, you know, that, that three-step theory mm -hmm. of suicide and everything. And something that I personally realized, and it's something that actually mindfulness meditation really mm -hmm. helped me with was understanding that thoughts kind of come and go and like you know there's a lot of meditations where it's like oh think about them as as clouds and and some thoughts are stickier than others like i'm a recovering addict like when i got the idea to use i couldn't get rid of it it was just there so this is kind of a two-parter question but so the first one i want to ask you is like you know because a lot of people when when that thought pops into their head like maybe this world would be better off without me. Maybe it's not worth even trying. Maybe nothing will get better, right? Like, I, I, I know there's probably not an exact number, but like, isn't this, I would think like, isn't this something that pops into everybody's head at least like once? And like, the reason I ask is because I feel like if we understood that this happens sometimes, you know, and it's part of, you know, the human experience, like maybe, maybe that'll help not make it so sticky. Absolutely. I think that's, that's a really important point that suicidal thoughts, even serious suicidal thoughts, that they're fairly common. I mean, even looking at past year suicidal thoughts, over 10 million people report in the United States having had serious suicidal thoughts. But in addition to that, one thing that I mention in the book is an interesting study where they asked people about if they had ever had a thought when they were near a bridge or a high place mm -hmm. of jumping off. And what they found is that a lot of people who never thought about suicide or considered suicide had that thought. And so it's really common to have, like you said, things pop into our head. And for, if you kind of are like, okay, that's an interesting thought, but whatever, that's just a thought. Mm -hmm. It doesn't kind of build in certain ways and spiral, but if it's kind of like, okay, well, that's weird. My brain just did that. I wonder why it did that. Is it warning me to stay away from the edge or mm -hmm. is it something deeper, something that I'm in pain about that I need to explore? So even having that ability to reflect and recognize that it's a common experience, that you're not alone 
and it doesn't it for most people it doesn't mean that you're going to attempt suicide most people who have thoughts do not attempt suicide mm -hmm. and that can be helpful to know that it's worth addressing and thinking about where it's coming from but also that it's a common experience that mm -hmm. people have yeah, yeah, especially like like you mentioned, like you know, uh, on top of a bridge or a high place or subway platform or whatever. Something that I I learned when I really started focusing on my mental health was like, I have thousands of thoughts a day. Half of them are completely insane. And you know, just for example, you know, I'm a recovering drug addict and alcoholic who lives in Las Vegas, right? Mm -hmm. The thought of like drinking and using it's there every single mm -hmm. day, even though I'm nine years sober. But it's not sticky and you know talking with other people working with other people when I was working in treatment it almost feels like when we kind of obsess and ruminate on that thought a little too much like it it makes us start obsessing right yeah. so so for example and this is just me and you know uh uh like I try to never overanalyze dreams right mm -hmm. I've seen people like it'll mess up their entire day and like I learned a long time ago like hey it's a dream I'm personally I'm just leaving it there it is right mm -hmm. so can you can you talk a little bit about that I'm not sure I'm sure it is somewhere in the book but like when it comes to that kind of stickiness of the thought and the rumination it's not a passing thought what are some of the kind of tools that you know are provided in the book for when it does stick around and mm -hmm. it's a passing thought yeah 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 it's a it's a great point and I, I also i there are sections on mindfulness and acceptance because of exactly what you're mm -hmm. saying if it's something like a dream or something and, and you think about it and there's not a lot of significance to it, then it doesn't need to be dug into. If someone is having suicidal thoughts and, and they wanna die, I think that it's important to one, um, approach yourself in a compassionate way as much as possible. I think sometimes when people have suicidal thoughts, they criticize themselves and why am I thinking this way? There's something really fundamentally wrong with me. There, you know, there's something just a fatal flaw about mm -hmm. me. And instead of thinking that way, it's kind of noticing non-judgmentally, okay, I'm having these thoughts. What are they telling me? Mm -hmm. Well, is it because, and this is where the workbook really asks people to think about what are the different areas. For some people, maybe they lost a loved one or they have a medical illness or they've been struggling with mental health problems. Once you've identified what the factors are underlying that pain, it opens up to finding the ways to help with that. So if it's someone who has post-traumatic stress disorder, you can seek treatment for that. If it is coping with accepting life has changed for some reason because of a loss, then there are tools in there for building acceptance and, and trying to soothe yourself in a self-compassionate way, because that's something I notice a lot with people who are struggling with suicidal thoughts. So they tend to be very self-critical. Mm -hmm. And instead, it's, it's looking for ways to approach yourself differently. I think one of the most concrete um, specific tools in there, although there are a lot of different worksheets, is hope building, because I mentioned mm -hmm. that suicidal thoughts tend to rise, especially when someone's in pain and when they're feeling hopeless. And so the HOPE acronym stands for, has some different exercises, but it breaks down to seeking help, like how can I connect with others to help me through this, um, finding optimism. Are there any little sparks looking ahead? I think when you're, when you're feeling suicidal, it's hard to find those things to look forward to. It's hard to think about reasons that things could be better. The P is about shifting perspective or changing perspective. Um, is there too much self flame? Are you assuming it'll be bad forever? And the E is for attending to emotions. And that's very much looking for ways to do healthy things that help you to feel better. Do you need more rest? Do you need to um, change a relationship that's not healthy for you? Do you need to connect to more people? So that's mm -hmm. one set of skills. Yeah, yeah, and 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 yeah, it's so interesting. Like self-compassion was huge for me. Like I, I, you know, I was a drug addict who screwed over everybody in my life. I wasn't there for my son. You know, I was terrible to, you know, my son's mom, my family, friends, everything like that. And no matter what people said about me, I was beating myself up way more. And that kind of guilt, like I'm nine years sober and I tell people like, I'm 
still struggling with some of this stuff. Like I, my, my son doesn't even remember me drinking and using because I got mm -hmm. sober when he was three. He doesn't even remember. But every once in a while, I get that pang of guilt. So learning self-compassion, a lot of it, you know, through mindfulness, uh, like loving kindness meditations. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, some of the best advice I ever got was, treat yourself like you would a friend, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. if, if anybody was talking to my friend, the way I talk to myself, like we'd have a problem. <laughs> you know what it, I mean? it, exactly. No, I think that, I think that's an incredibly helpful tool and mm -hmm. you're right. You can't change the past, but you can give yourself credit for making those very difficult changes to go into recovery and maintain it. And so mm -hmm. I do think that that's so important because otherwise it's very hard to live a, a good life if you're walking around criticizing yourself all the time. Yeah, yeah. And and the other thing you touched on, Hope, that's mm -hmm. that's actually a little a little self-promo plug. That was the first book that I, I self-published was called Hope. And it's my story of uh, overcoming depression and anxiety and addiction. And that's the one thing that kept me going was this, this hope, right? Just a little glimmer of hope because for a long time, I felt absolutely hopeless. And I know you talk about this in the book, like support, support groups and things like that. Mm -hmm. But what helped me out a ton, and not everybody has access to this because they're not drug addicts and alcoholics, but I went to 12 step meetings and mm -hmm. I saw people who were where I, I was and things got better for them. And now I try to give that to others. Like if people could only see where I was nine, 10 years ago, you know, but that hope kept me going just a little bit. So how, how do we find hope when everything seems hopeless? Cause our brain can make us seem like, nope, that that's going to turn out terrible. That's going to turn out terrible. All that. Where do we, where do we find that hope? Absolutely. That I think the one of the other major frames of the book is cognitive behavioral therapy and talks about how when you're in a down state and having suicidal thoughts, often your brain is looking for the negatives and and even if there's something positive, kind of disqualifying it. Like someone says something nice to me, well, mm -hmm. they're they don't really mean it. They're just trying to be nice or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so I I think that's one of the huge strengths of 12-step programs that they have built in really good support a sponsor, people who are at all different stages of change. And I think that's really important. There are peer support for mental health in a lot of areas. And I think it serves the same kind of ability to promote hope. You can talk to someone who knows firsthand what you've been through and you can see a difference. Other things that I think about is I try to ask people, look in, look in the past, were there things you thought you'd never get through, but you were able to get mm -hmm. through? How do you get through that? And, and, and kind of building on some of those strengths and recognizing your ability to do that. The other part of it is thinking that there are, feeling suicidal can feel so alone and feel like you're things that work for other people are not going to work for you. And so trying to understand that there are resources available, but you can reach out to them and that you're worthy of that can be really helpful. So peer supports, kind of looking to others for inspiration. I actually think that's been a really positive thing that more celebrities have talked about their mental health struggles, mm -hmm. because I think that allows people to also look at those stories and feel hopeful. Yeah, yeah. And like, and like you said, too, like, like, I'm 36 years old, and something that has saved my butt on multiple occasions is how many times in my lifetime, right, since I was a toddler, have I said, I'm never going to get through this, this is yep. never going to get yep. better, right. Mm -hmm. And I remind myself of that regularly. And, uh, you know, I've talked about it on the podcast and everything. But like in 2019, I had the internet coming after me. And I it was the worst mental place mm -hmm. I've been in in ages, right? Like thoughts of relapse, thoughts of suicide mm -hmm. and all that. And something that helped me get through that difficult time, aside from like my support, like my, my family, my lovely girlfriend and all that was remembering how much I've been through and how much mm -hmm. I've overcome. And if nothing else, that reminds me that, you know, I, I'm resilient and I'm a survivor and I can get through stuff, you know, and here I am two years from that experience and I'm, you know, I'm fine. And, and we look back on it like, oh, wow, that was trivial. And even if it's a job loss or a breakup or, mm -hmm. you know, financial difficulties, you know what I mean? Um, but, you know, so much of this, well, not so much, all of this is happening between our two ears. And you just mentioned CBT. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's right here in the subtitle of the workbook, like CBT skills. So, I always try to explain CBT to people. It's this evidence-based, amazing therapeutic practice. 
and I think I do a terrible job explaining it. So can you discuss what is CBT? Why is it so effective? Why, why should people turn to this book and learn some CBT skills to work on this? Absolutely. Cognitive behavioral therapy is, I, it, it kind of, um, Aaron Beck basically created it and it was from clinical work, working with people. And he was trained actually in psychoanalysis and, and a Freud kind of background, but he started noticing patterns and thoughts that people had about themselves, about the world. And developed cognitive behavioral therapy from that. So the basic idea is that when you're experiencing depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, there are certain perceptions that are maintaining that. And so when it's depression, often it's a lot of all or nothing thinking. So mm -hmm. you try to do something and there's some, you get feedback at work about something and everything's great except one small criticism and your brain latches onto that and it disqualifies all the positive. So a lot of it is about filtering the negative or it can be things like mind reading, like assuming that someone's mad at you because they didn't, they had like a facial expression or they didn't text you back right away or whatever it is when they might just have something else completely going on. And so the idea is that these are automatic thoughts they are not things that we do on purpose, mm -hmm. but that the world is happening and our interpretations of them influence our emotions. In addition, behaviors are connected too. So if I feel really socially anxious and my thought is that, you know, people are going to think bad things about me. So I'm going to avoid going out and talking to people. That anxiety is just going to continue to strengthen because the avoidance reduces the anxiety. And then I learn, okay, avoidance is the way to cope with it. So what cognitive behavioral therapy does is help to identify the thoughts identify what the potential thinking errors might be, mm -hmm. and then go through the evidence. This isn't about positive thinking. It's not about that. It's about evidence-based taking a, learning to be a curious scientist, yeah. going through the evidence and coming up with a reframed thought that is more accurate. And so the truth is that if I give a speech or something and I started stammering in the middle of it, and afterwards, I'm thinking the whole thing was a complete failure. Everybody thinks I'm an idiot. Then cognitive behavioral therapy wouldn't just go, oh, you were fine. You didn't really stammer. It would say, okay, in reality, a lot of people do that when they're giving presentations. Overall, it was pretty good. And even if people thought that wasn't great, I can still tolerate it and live like it. So that's kind of the as brief of a version as I can give. Yeah. But you can see why it's so can be so powerful. And I've certainly felt that in my own life, that it's been a powerful tool that doesn't take away all the pain, but it can reduce it or at least shift my perspective on things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know what, I'm going to tell you something, Katie, because mm -hmm. you're probably the only one who'll understand who's been on my podcast. So with all the books that I read from su such a wide range of topics from psychology to philosophy and science, it's all about CBT and working on my mental health. And I try to teach that that's one of the reasons like, I'm like, we can take something from every book. But anyways, what I'm getting at is like, I've had uh, people on my podcast who debunk conspiracy theories mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. All of us, you're not going to meet somebody and say, hey, are you a rational thinker? And they'll say, no, I'm completely right. right. We all like to think that we're scientific, rational thinkers. And that's what CBT is. So like mm -hmm. what you're talking about, like when we get those, those thoughts, like uh, things are never going to get better or this person hates me. I used to struggle with crippling social anxiety. I couldn't even have these conversations. And all it was was taking a step back, getting curious, questioning it like a scientist, like how, like, where would I find the evidence that everybody hates me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. where, where is that solid evidence? Is this a fact or is this opinion? You know what I mean? And it's all about sitting back and questioning my thoughts. So when I'm reading books about like conspiracy theories and debunking mm -hmm. those, I'm still gathering tools to work on this thing mm -hmm. right here, because like, I can't look at, you know, conspiracy theories of the flat earth and stuff, but then believe my own ridiculous thoughts that just come through. So, so that's kind of my little secret hack that I'm hoping to spread to other people and show that like we could pull this from other things. So, and you, you mentioned that you do research, like you're a researcher too. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. do you take some of those tools and apply it to your daily life and the thinking and stuff like that that comes through? A absolutely. I think that I, I very much, the program that I was in in graduate school was a clinical scientist program. And in mm. therapy, 
I am a scientist who's coming up with hypotheses, testing them out. And with compassion, all of that is very compassionate because I think sometimes people feel like that means that you're kind of robotic. No, what it means is that I'm, I have humility to know that I, that I might be wrong. And what I yeah. mean by testing hypotheses is checking in with the person to see if what I'm saying is helping or if I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, that means saying, okay, well, I checked out the evidence, I was wrong. Let me go back and let's try something else together versus really kind of digging in my heels and saying this has to be the right thing. So I, I think like you, I mean, all the time in my work and my research and my therapy, I try to think like a scientist. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't, um, it doesn't mean that there's no pain or hurt or anything like that in the world, but it does mean that there are ways of reducing suffering in areas where there might not be an issue or where we're thinking, okay, now everything's bad because of that. So someone had asked me previously, like, do you use any of the tools of the workbook? I use these tools all the time. Right? I mean, yeah. I think that since my father was a therapist and he gave me a CBT book by David Burns called Feeling Good mm. when I was in college. And that had a big effect on the way that I was able to think about things. Like it was groundbreaking to me to think, okay, don't assume that someone doesn't like me because they didn't respond to me right away or whatever it was, just stuff like that. Or don't assume that everything's gonna be a disaster. And so this is something I've been practicing for years and years and years. And I do mm -hmm. find it very helpful in a lot of different domains, including sorting through news and, and making decisions and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. You, aside from CBT, mm -hmm. my second favorite therapy is from Albert Ellis, R-E-B-T. Yeah. I love that. When I, when I read uh, his book, what is it like? How to like stubbornly refuse to make yourself miserable yeah. or whatever. And, and yeah, and it, it really helps me dial it down. Cause like you mentioned, like it doesn't get rid of the pain or the hurt, but like REBT taught me, like I even told my therapist when I came across, I'm like, mm -hmm. hey, do you got any REBT stuff? Because like when something happens and my brain wants to catastrophize it, REBT teaches me like, yes, this is terrible or yes, this hurts, but no, this feeling isn't going to kill me. No, right. this isn't going to last forever. It helps me just kind of dampen it and turn the volume down on that emotion just a little bit or that thought or, or whatever it is. And, and here's, here's one of the main reasons I wanted to talk to you too, that I keep thinking about as we're having this conversation is, you know, it's all about work and putting in the work and, you know, you have worksheets mm -hmm. and everything mm -hmm. is doing something, but, you know, we all have different symptoms of depression, right? But one that I see seems to hit everybody when we're depressed or feeling suicidal, or whatever it is, is the lack of motivation. Yeah. So it's like, if I'm not motivated, I'm not going to go to the store and buy your book. I'm not going to even go to Amazon and order your book. I'm not going to, you know, and even if I do, it's going to sit over there and I'm not going to do it. So like that, I feel like that is just such a root issue that we have to tackle. So what do we, what do we do about that? How do we, how do we just get that ball rolling so we we want to do the work to get better you're 100 percent right it is one of the hardest things in therapy that i think before receiving training to be a therapist i didn't understand how much motivation was a big piece of what i work on as a therapist right mm -hmm. it's like great you have all these skills but you got to meet people where they're at and that's why i do think that self-help is important that it's available because it, you can have greater access to it. And some people don't want to go in to see a therapist, but it does help whether it's a therapist or it's in a 12 step group, or it's someone else in your life, having someone who can sit with you and say, okay, maybe you can't go through this whole workbook from start to finish, mm. but can we look at, this is actually why the table of contents has like a, um, a very lengthy second table of contents that just lists every worksheet. Yeah. His idea is that someone could say, I'm, I'm in a lot of pain right now and I, I need something that they could look at that. And while they, the whole book is too much for them in that moment or whatever, maybe they can pick one worksheet from that and do that and see if that helps and if that builds things up. And it is a theme throughout the book, which is, I know this is hard. And 
taking little steps are a big deal. Like don't dismiss it because you can't go all your way through it. So I think it is a real issue and something that is why, you know, therapy still exists is because people like that interpersonal part mm -hmm. and feeling supported as they go through it. So I don't, I don't think there are any easy answers to it. I, one thing that I noticed is I think a lot of people get mental health information from things like TikTok or social media or other things like that. Mm -hmm. And so I did try to think about, okay, what are some bite-sized ways to put things in there? And then actually the, the illustrator that I collaborated with for the book, part of that idea was like, maybe it's too much to have all this text to go through, but maybe a picture or an image might help people to just have a couple of ideas that they mm -hmm. could get through. Yeah, yeah, and kind of like you mentioned too, just, uh, I, yeah, I loved how you, you broke that down. You have like the worksheets just listed out right there because sometimes it's just, I need to open this or, you know, whatever. And it's, it's all about these, like these baby steps. So quick question for you. I don't know if, sure. you, if you've read the book or you know of his work, uh, but Dr. Alex Kaur wrote a book called Upward Spiral. Have you heard of that book? I am familiar with it, but I haven't read it actually. So that book was really helpful to me. He was actually on my YouTube channel oh. like a year or two ago, but something I learned from that book was just like, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's a lot of it's like based around neuroscience, uh, but it's it's accomplishing these very small goals and it kind of like ignites this, you know, upward spiral. So, you know, and that's something I kind of learned even in my recovery, because I think aside from the lack of motivation, it seems overwhelming, right? Yes. Like when I'm thinking about getting therapy, I'm thinking about, oh, I got to look up a therapist. I got to research the therapist. Are they a good therapist? What, and then I call them and I got to set all that up and I got to deal with going there or, you know, whatever it is. And what if I don't like them? All these things, right? And, you know, when I was getting sober, it's like, I got to stay sober forever. And people yeah. are like, no, stay sober today. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. And mm -hmm. I'm like, well, today's pretty rough. They're like, okay, stay sober for the next hour. Things like that. So like, even when it comes to, you know, my depression and lack of motivation, it's like, do this one small yes. thing. Like I used to call in sick to work like half a year, like not, not that much, but all the mm -hmm. time. Right. And it was all these, and I, I just had no motivation to do anything. And, you know, uh, for years now, like I'm known as the guy who doesn't even call in sick when I am sick, because a lot of it is when I'm not feeling motivated, like I'm just like, just do one little thing, yep. just do it. Yep. And sometimes like, uh, you know, that's just with my son, right? Like, mm -hmm. okay, I am I gotta, you know, make him lunch or help him with something. Well, he's 12 now and I've been getting him into cooking. So he's like, he's kind of making perfect. Now. <laughs> yeah, but it's just these little things that I find it just kind of gets that spark going. Um, but, uh, absolutely. And I, I, if you don't mind, I think that that spark idea, the illustration with the sparklers is 100% mm, what you're saying. It is yeah. very hard to think big picture and it's demotivating to think about, oh, I have to do all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and here's a question. It's kind of a more of a societal thing. And I'm, I'm sure you've recognized it, but like when it comes to the conversation around mental health, I get I get conflicted and I'm curious your thoughts because sometimes it's uh, like, you'll see maybe memes or something floating around mm -hmm. and it's like, uh, you know, uh, I'm depressed. I can't just go for a walk or I'm yeah. depressed. I can't just do this. And I'm like, I get what you're saying that it's not an easy fix, but at the same time, it feels like it's encouraging a do nothing type yeah. thing. So so I'm curious your thoughts, like, have you, have you noticed that? And I get that we shouldn't be like pressuring people and we should be understanding and empathetic of their feelings. But at the same time, like for those of us who have friends and things like that, like we want to encourage them and not just be like, oh yeah, nothing's going to help you, you know? So, so what, what are your thoughts around that and those memes and conversations that kind of happen about just don't do anything? That That's such a fantastic question. I think that, <laughs> that with one of the things that I really like about cognitive behavioral therapy is it talks about how, how basically you can not want to do things, but you can still do them. Right. And, yeah. and, and so the way that I look at it is I very compassionately, which is like, I get that it's hard and why it's such a struggle. And that with anxiety and depression, I get it. That is real. That's a hundred percent valid. And if you do this thing you're nervous about, 
that's actually more compassionate for me to encourage you to do that, especially as a therapist in my personal life, totally different boundaries. But as a therapist, yeah. if you do that, because you're going to see, oh, you actually can do that. It's not as bad as you thought it was going to be. And you can tolerate anxiety. Same with depression too. It's like, if I get that it's hard, okay, well, going for a walk is short. Let's dial it down. Can you sit outside for a little bit? Mm -hmm. The idea is doing something so that you don't feel stuck and, and build that hopelessness. And so I think that we can be very compassionate and understanding, but I, I actually think some of this comes up in like um, self-care ideas and narratives too, mm -hmm. that self-care can be essential, that we're taking care of our needs and things like that. But sometimes is it avoidance? Like self-care means that I'm, I'm not going to do a bunch of stuff that I need to do to kind of take care of myself. Yeah. And so I do think that all of these ideas can, in a meme form, the nuance can be removed from them. And I do get concerned about that. In therapy, you can have a conversation and, and talk about it with nuance. With memes, it's much harder to do that. Yeah, yeah, and that that's kind of one of the things that I that I realize. So yeah, without diving too much into it, but the the issue that I ran into in 2019, like I I got better from like a little bit of tough love, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people, you know, when I was you know in in the deepest darkest places, would enable me and like, yeah, don't do this, don't do that, mm -hmm. you know. And they they kind of encouraged that kind of behavior. And to get better, I needed people to say, hey, it's time to get off your butt and go do just a little bit of something, even if you don't want to, right? And uh, and, and and yeah, because it's it's difficult to have those conversations, but sometimes we need to hear it. And like you mentioned, there's there's more nuance that that kind of comes in, and it's like, okay, but you could do a little something. And, and, and that's my concern where it's, you know, especially with like jobs and everything and uh, not allowing like mental health days and all that. Yeah. Because when I'm talking with a friend or someone who even comes to me just through my YouTube channel or social media mm -hmm. and says, oh, you know, what do you think about mental health days? I'm like, as long as you do something with it. Yeah. Like, yeah. like if you take a mental health day and you sit there like binging Netflix and downing a gallon of ice cream, I wouldn't really call that a mental health day like go for a walk get get a few things done like whatever so there's a great question if i'm feeling overwhelmed depressed anxious whatever it is and i'm taking a mental health day what are some things that i could do katie that that is a, that is very individualized i think and and i think that what something that you're talking about with ice cream and and netflix which may be very appropriate at times, but other yeah. times might not be. The test that I think of is what am I going to feel good about? Where's my, a, a day from now, a week from now, six months from now, mm -hmm. if your mental health is truly going to feel better from Netflix and ice cream and not doing anything else. Okay, cool. Do it. But if you're actually going to feel like, oh, you know, my, I still didn't do my laundry or I still have bills piling up or I feel so guilty because I didn't get any, you know, I didn't get any outdoor time or didn't anything in that, then that's not a great thing to do or do that and something else. And so I really try to think about self-care mental health days is like, what is the thing that I am going to feel good about, refreshed, renewed about the next day? Because if I have to go back to work, I want to actually feel better. That's the whole goal yeah. of it. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think it's great that you said that, like, I, you know, do, do whatever you want. Like, like, cause I'll sit there and I'll binge Netflix with my mm -hmm. son and girlfriend and stuff like that. But it's like, I feel good about the quality time. Cause I'm a, I'm a workaholic, right. You know, like I love to work. Like after this, I go to my full-time job and mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff. But uh, you know, if, if Netflix and ice cream is your thing, but it's like, you know, earlier we were talking about the self-compassion. If after I down that ice cream and binge Netflix? Am I going to beat myself up yeah. over Because if that's going to be the result, then maybe I shouldn't. But here, here's something to kind of continue this topic, like, you know, about like memes and, you know, uh, like one of them that I see too, is just like, I'm having an anxiety attack. Don't tell me to just breathe. Right. And so I want to know <laughs> how much or how important do you think education is around improving your mental health because I read an insane amount of books and I've learned like like when I was 
new and someone's like, oh, just take deep breaths. I'm like, that's dumb. But now I know about the vagus nerve. Right. I know about different studies around how it helps. Or when people say, go for a walk outside, I'm like, what? But now I know about studies around how being in nature and go, I go for a walk every single morning now. I listen to audiobooks or pie, you know? So, so again, like without knowing the research and the science behind it, of course it sounds stupid. So how, how big of a, a role do you think education plays in, in improving yourself, like knowing the, the science behind like what you're telling people to do in this workbook? I think that that's huge. And in therapy, CBT, one of the things I like about it is it's big on education. And the type of approach that I take in therapy is very much comes from uh, two approaches, motivational interviewing and self-determination theory. And what that suggests is like all of us by our nature, if someone tells us to do something, not all of us, but most of us are like, I don't want to do that. Yeah. And that sounds too simple for my complex problem. So <laughs> I think that having a rationale, like you're saying, knowing the background, the research and the reasoning for it opens us up to try things, to at least try them. And mm -hmm. so I was glad that someone had told me because I, so most of my writing has been academic. And so writing the workbook was really mm. different. And I was worried. I, I didn't want to get too um, in the weeds about research and stuff that wasn't really interesting to people. But at least one person told me that that helped them to feel like they weren't being talked down to and just told to do a bunch of stuff that they were like, the reason I'm suggesting you do this is because research shows that it helps. So I think that's key so much that like I front loaded the book with that because it's like, why should you listen to me? I don't know you. Why should you take my suggestions? Well, I don't know you personally, but what I do know both from therapeutic experiences and from research is that these things tend to help so that they're worth trying kind of thing. So yeah, mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think it's huge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a, a doctor, uh, Dr. Judson Brewer. Uh, he does a lot of studies around like neuroscience and mindfulness and everything. Mm -hmm. And something uh, I learned from him a while back, he, he called it the brain mechanic. And he and maybe it's because I had a history in like car repair service. Mm -hmm. But he explained how like, you know, if, if you don't know anything about cars, and you're driving down the road in the middle of nowhere, and a light comes on, you don't know anything, you're gonna freak out. Yep. But if you have a little bit of mechanical knowledge, you're going to be like, oh, here's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And he he made that analogy to discuss why it's important that we learn about how our brains work. And, and I, I adapt that to like, that's why I want to know what the research says. What do the studies say? And all this, because now I know what I'm doing. Does it work? How effective is it? And it's also helped me know options, right? Because sometimes, and I'm sure you've run into this, you know, uh, as a therapist, like, we'll try one thing and it doesn't work. And then yeah. we just get this idea, nothing works, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and it's like, like, no, maybe, maybe this didn't work for you, but that will and, and stuff. So, so that's another thing. Like, do you try to, in this workbook, do you try to cover a wide range of options? Like from like writing to physical activity to support group and all that kind of stuff. What kind of options are out there for dealing with depression and suicidal thoughts? Totally. I think therapy and our own journeys in mental health are a lot more trial and error than we'd like <laughs> to think. But even we think about how medications work and a lot of the time mm. it's trial and error to figure out what's going to work for what person. We don't automatically know this is going to help with anxiety or this is going to help with depression. Therapy is the same way. And I try to be pretty transparent about that in the book and in therapy, which is that I want, you know, let's try, what are you willing to try? Try a couple of those things. But if those don't work, don't worry. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that we can try. And that's where I, I completely agree with you that the education is important because that alone can give if you hope because you recognize that one, you know, you're not alone in it and that so much, you're so not alone in it that people have studied it and people have created different treatments for it because the same treatment doesn't work for everyone. Maybe it's not CBT, maybe it's acceptance and commitment therapy or dialectical mm -hmm. behavior therapy, or maybe it's pulling from these different sources. And the idea then is that you can make your own you can take those tools that work for you, but even if those don't work later, there are others available. And so mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. I think that it's so important to know that 
it's more of a curiosity. Let's see what works versus a like, this is the one answer. If it doesn't work for you, you're out of luck kind of thing, which is, which could be really uh, devastating. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's something that, that saved me early on. I think like the first month or two when I got sober, I only had like three tools, right? Mm -hmm. It was like a meeting, uh, call my sponsor or read like the, the, a, a big book. Those are the only three. Mm -hmm. And I just kept recycling through those. And eventually one of them worked. Right. And now nine years later, I have this like metaphorical toolbox that's the size of my apartment, right? And I, I just, oh, that didn't work. Okay, I'll try this. That didn't work. I'll try this. That didn't work. I'll try this. And and it's just going through that Rolodex of tools that we have. And, and the more, you know, you research and investigate and try new things, because even, even now there's some things that work for me one day, but the mm -hmm. next day they don't, mm -hmm. right? Like some days nothing's working and I'm, I'm like pretty introverted. And I don't like asking for help, but mm -hmm. some days I'm like, I hit a brick wall. It's time to reach out to my friend or, mm -hmm. or something like that. But mm -hmm. um, I, I have a little bit more of your time and something uh, I, I, I wanted to ask you about since we're coming slowly coming out of COVID and all that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, the rising depression rates, rising suicide rates when kids were being home or not homeschooled, but doing distance learning last mm -hmm. year. A lot of people were talking about their mental health. And we talked about this a little bit before the call. Like my my concern is I, ever since I started looking into this stuff, addiction and suicide rates and depression and anxiety, all these rates have been rising, right? So from what you've seen in the last year, how much has COVID affected this? And, you know, uh, is there anything we should be, you know, looking at as why these rates have just been rising in general since pre-COVID? Yeah, it's, it's really was surprising to see that in 2020 and 2019, finally the suicide rate slightly decreased after rising mm. for years and years while suicidal thoughts, like, like you mentioned, and, and overdoses increased in 2020. And so the question about why this is happening, I think it's so complicated and it's ultimately dissatisfying to talk to people like me about because I, it's hard to speculate. And so I, I, I usually try not to speculate too much. I think that there were some surprising um, potential buffers during 2020, despite rises in suicidal thoughts because of telehealth. I actually think that's a huge deal that insurance started covering telehealth so that the people, more people can have therapy. I mean, out in areas where there aren't that many therapists. I think that's one thing that like we should hold on to and mm -hmm. carry that forward. But I also think there's been a lot of looking at working and um, work environments. And was it for some people working from home helpful? Were they able to connect more with their family? Mm -hmm. And is there any way that we can have more flexibility? And it seems like for some workplaces, they are thinking, okay, well, maybe sometimes people can work from home. And that's okay because maybe that relieves some of the stress for them. Whereas others are like, no, it's back to kind of pre pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so I, I worry a lot about, about the suicidal thoughts at rising and, and the rates at any level, because I do think that some of them come down to things like, okay, more access to therapy and, and things like that. But I also think there are these huge factors that are much bigger than that, like access to healthcare. If someone has a medical condition and they're unable to, to seek the care they need without going broke, they're more likely to have suicidal thoughts, right? Because they're more likely to be facing mm -hmm. that. I think that even the changes in the Affordable Care Act allowing for pre people with pre-existing conditions to be insured was a huge change. I wonder about this, um, uh, this child tax kind of um, allowance that we're getting, the benefits that might have, having that type of money, because I do think a lot of times suicidal thoughts, they can come from all kinds of places, but sometimes they're things like not having basic needs met, um, work stress, not being able to access care. And so I hope that 
there's more thought in, in suicide prevention. I do see this more in the organization I belong to, um, looking at those big kind of um, upstream factors and not just looking at like, when do we intervene later? So I kind of rambled and didn't really answer your question that well. No, but... that was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, no, that's the thing. And as you, as you were talking, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, she's right. Like it's, it, there's no satisfactory answer. Like, and this is why I encourage people to go to therapy and get books like yours. And we have to figure out what our thing is, right? Yeah. Like being home, like, has been a blessing for me, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, the 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 time it took for me to get to work, like that took two hours a day away from spending time with my son and my girlfriend and things like that, right? Um, and and like you mentioned, there's economic issues. There's so yep. many things. And yeah. when we when we you know when we do these types of worksheets or whatever, we can see what our thing is, and then we can hyper focus on, oh, this is it because. Something that I, I recently was, I've, I've been really interested in evolutionary psychology mm -hmm. lately too. And something that I, I forgot who it was, it might've been Jesse Baring in his book, but he brought up uh, that, uh, you know, sometimes suicidal thoughts come from this idea that it would be better for the tribe if I wasn't here because mm -hmm. I am taking resources away from them mm -hmm. and I am not worth it, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're unemployed, if we don't have money to support people, you know, there's people who think like, oh, if my kids just get my life insurance money, they'll be better yeah. than if I'm around. Hell, I don't even know why I'm like using other people as an example. When I was at the end of my addiction at rock bottom and they were like begging me to stop and get better, I was telling them that my son would be better off without me, mm. right? It'd be mm. better for him if he didn't have to worry about his addict dad and, you know, and things like that. But hey, worked on my addiction. Now I know that little sucker needs me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I can benefit him and I can provide, I can be there for him. Um, but, but yeah, so part of this, and, and it's crazy because I, I often forget how casually I could talk about all this stuff. And one of the last things I wanted to ask you, because I think it's a major part of this conversation and how do we get people talking about this? There's a lot of talk and I, we could talk about this forever, but I just want your brief thoughts. Like there's a lot of talk around trigger warnings, suicide in media, like I'm sure you heard about all the stuff around 13 reasons why mm -hmm. and all this. And I hear conflicting research around like trigger warnings and all that. Like for example, when prepping for this, I was like, do I put a trigger warning at the beginning or whatever? But I've heard conflicting research that if you put a trigger warning, it's almost like the don't think of a white bear. Right. Right. So, so when it comes to these conversations, like what are your thoughts around like media and trigger warnings and, and things like how important important are they without you know we could talk about this if, if we have to we'll do a whole another episode but <laughs> but yeah what are your thoughts around this to just because I see it as a net positive because we get to have more conversations and it starts a discussion yeah absolutely I think that I think that it's useful to give people a heads up about what the content is about that they're gonna they're gonna listen to there's been some interesting research in there's actually an experimental study looking at two articles about suicide. One told about how the method that the person died by suicide in it, and the other kind of followed more typical media guidelines. And they didn't find that details about the method of suicide, at least in their sample, which I believe was uh, were college undergrads, had the effect that some might think that mm. it would. So I think that one, I think obviously there's controversy around this. My personal feeling after the reading of the literature, talking to people, all that stuff, is it's good to give people a heads up about what you're talking about. It's good to talk about difficult things and not avoid those things. Mm -hmm. But it's also, if someone's in a vulnerable space where that's not going to be helpful to them, then it's good for them just to know ahead of time, like, okay, maybe I won't watch 13 Reasons Why if I'm really depressed and they have these, you know, graphic details and scenes and stuff like that. So I think that it's a balance. One thing that I also think is important when talking about suicide or other difficult things is to always balance it with that hope, mm. with the idea. There are resources available. There are treatments. You're not alone. There is support. So that piece of it, regardless of however else things are talked about, is important. And I think the other piece is 
describing things without blaming people. And, and that's those two things. If you can not blame people and say, hey, there are ways to get help, there are resources and you're not alone, that I think can do a lot of good. Asking people about suicide does a good thing. It can open up conversations where they might have not before. I think being direct about it is helpful because, you know, part of the reason the title is, is the Suicidal Thoughts Workbook, right? Like a lot of self-help books have, you know, just feel good. With, no offense to David Burns. I didn't, I actually didn't mean to use that as an example. <laughs> it's a great I book. I love his book. <laughs> That's like a major book that I love, but a lot of them are more about like just generically like um, make your life great or whatever it is. I wanted something so that if someone is having suicidal thoughts, they know this is the suicidal yeah. thoughts workbook. So I think I tend to lean on the side of let's openly discuss, let's give people a heads up, but the only way we're going to talk about this thing and, and take away some of the taboo of it is to be open and direct and name it as it is and not dance around it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's one of the reasons I, I wanted to have you on and was excited to check out the workbook, like, because it's it's right there, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. sometimes it's like, we, we don't even know. And like, you know, that's why I, as a YouTuber, I, I have issues with YouTube, because they suppress yeah. stuff that talks about <laughs> depression and suicide. I'm like, Oh, what if somebody's trying to find it? You exactly. Know what I mean? but, exactly. But yeah, there is there's so much in this book. And I, I hope everybody listening gets a copy checks it out just to understand because we didn't even get to cover there's there's stuff in here about when to see a, a, a professional mm -hmm. there's stuff in here for like friends and family like mm -hmm. there's so much in this book like I, I hope people get it so if nothing else it helps people understand and empathize and and if they do encounter someone who's struggling they could be like boom I got some worksheets for you so so Katie before I let you go, where where can people find you to keep up with all the cool stuff you're doing and where can they find this book? Well, thank you so much for your kind words, Chris, and for this interview. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you. And I love what you're doing because like you said, you're talking openly about your experiences. I know that that helps people. Mm -hmm. um, so I am on Twitter too much. My handle is at <laughs> Dr. Catherine Gordon. K, uh, D -R -K -T -H -R -Y -N -G -R -D -O -N. My website is katherinehgordon.com. I'm on Instagram with the same handle. I'm not on there as much. My book is available at most places that sell books. So Amazon, Bookshop, IndieBound, Barnes and Noble, um, directly from my publisher, which is, which is New Harbinger. Mm -hmm. And it's not a replacement for therapy, but it's another resource that is out there and that I sincerely hope reaches people who are struggling and that you feel supported by it. Awesome. I love it. I will be linking all that stuff down below. So Katie, I know we'll be, we'll be chatting, you know, again yeah, soon, but absolutely. thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. Thank you, Chris. <laughs>